Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome again to our sixth webinar. Um, uh, we are excited to be uh, past the, the halfway point here, um, and we're going into a second week focused on research and, and resources for, for AI development. Um, so I, I, I'd like to welcome you all back. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our, our guest speakers from the National Science Foundation and, and IBM. Um, and in particular, I'd like to, to, to welcome and thank uh, uh, our participants, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sally Radwan and Dr. Juan Gutierrez, who have graciously uh, agreed to, to, to speak as well uh, and give us some of their time to talk about the work that they're doing uh, relevant to this topic. Uh, I'd also like to highlight uh, a development in the program. Uh, we've now scheduled our next regional workshop uh, in Prague. Uh, that will be taking place in the first week of November, uh, currently scheduled November 1st through 3rd. So uh, our uh, members, uh, uh, so some of our members will be uh, in the region will be getting uh, invites soon. So I, I, I would ask you to, to be on the lookout for that. So during our last webinar, we spoke a lot about uh, research around artificial intelligence and how to best uh, support and, and resource that. Um, and today we're going to go a little bit more into, into AI infrastructure and the AI ecosystem. So the United States believes that, that global partnerships for the development and deployment of AI, uh, ranging from research on the underlying algorithms uh, to the allocation of talent, are, are all integral to advancing the state of art, uh, state of the art in AI, uh, and ensuring that the full scale of its benefits are, are met. Domestically, the United States is committed to, to fostering a healthy AI R&D ecosystem uh, and ensuring that it remains a scientific hub and research uh, partner first choice. Um, we strongly support uh, uh, continued investment in joint basic and applied research, R&D infrastructure, and other areas. Uh, I won't go too deeply into that since uh, we'll be uh, hearing uh, in much greater and, and expert detail from, uh, uh, from our speakers later. Uh, internationally, the United States also supports international AI collaborations and partnerships that are grounded in evidence-based approaches, analytical research, and multi-stakeholder engagements that bring diverse perspectives together. Uh, our science and technology cooperation agreements and their associated bilateral engagements strengthen international cooperation in scientific areas aligned with U.S. interests uh, and help lay the scientific foundations for greater AI cooperation. So international R&D collaboration is necessary to support many of the aims uh, that we talk about in this program uh, and uh, in building AI systems that ensure fairness, accountability, transparency, reliability, security, and safety. Uh, international cooperation also uh, needs to develop metrics, test methodologies, standards, best practices, and other tools to support the design development and use of trustworthy AI technologies. Uh, we welcome collaboration with allies and partners to guard against potential dangers and mitigate risks that undermine the global R&D system. Uh, many of those risks that we, we talk about in this program. Uh, however, all of these measures are primarily about establishing the framework uh, and uh, support system around uh, AI. All countries still have to deal with the very real constraints of what is often referred to as the AI triad. Uh, three key resources, uh, advanced computing power, large data, uh, large data sets and, uh, and data sources, uh, as well as the development of the actual algorithms themselves. Uh, as we heard during Assistant Secretary for Economic and Business Affairs to Louis' remarks during our very first webinar, uh, advantages in these areas can be self-reinforcing. Uh, models developed and trained with larger and higher quality data sets and with uh, uh, better computing power uh, will perform better, potentially creating a gap where countries that already have an advantage grow that advantage and create a gap between uh, the most advanced uh, AI developers uh, and everyone else. So a key question is how to help countries improve access to the infrastructure and resources necessary to be truly competitive, including for those who hope to be developers of AI technologies rather than just consumers. The United States is interested in enhancing access to shared public data sets and environments for AI training, as well as testing and developing privacy preser preserving techniques, uh, particularly given the wide application of AI across sectors, 
uh, including health, climate, energy, agriculture, and others. Uh, we're also interested in increasing AI researchers' access to advanced computing resources like cloud computing and public-facing supercomputing. But we're very lucky today to hear from some experts who are looking at these issues from the perspective of the US government, industry, uh, and some of our AI Connect member countries. Uh, I look forward to learning more about the AI ecosystem uh, and hearing all of your questions for our speakers. Uh, I'd like to hand it off now to Julian to give an update about the, the program today. Well, thank you very much, Rich, and um, good to see everyone. Also, a warm welcome from the geotech side uh, here at the Atlantic Council. I'm very delighted that we've made it, um, you know, to the sixth webinar with with all of you uh, still on board, and many who will, uh, you know, um, watch the recording later. Um, we really appreciated the feedback that has uh, continued to come in uh, as we try to improve uh, and make the program uh, better and and more adapt to to your needs. And just to provide a little bit of context of where we are and where we're going to be, in addition to what Rich um, already said, uh, as you know, today you are going to be exposed to technical aspects of AI development. <clears throat> so from building unbiased data sets, which the second panel um, is focusing on to, um, you know, computing power, uh, which, which Lloyd and uh, Margaret will, will talk about, um, and to local case studies um, of algorithmic transparency, as well as the challenges of um, finding sort of adequate data that, that works in local context. So we're very excited about this. And um, I am particularly excited about the next webinar, which then will be um, on uh, you know, the future of work in a technologically apt workforce and how we can come up with government strategies um, for uh, effective you know, systemic AI oversight and promotion, as well as mitigating some of the uh, social and potentially negative effects uh, of that technological change. Um, we're also very much looking forward to welcoming those of you um, that will be joining us uh, in Europe, in Prague, um, uh, the, for the next in-person webinar. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Lloyd, uh, who'll be moderating uh, the first panel and will introduce Margaret. Lloyd, over to you. Yeah, it's great, great to be here. And I'm looking forward to meeting more of you in Prague. Um, so uh, I'm gonna uh, happy to introduce uh, my fireside chat uh, companion here, uh, Margaret Martinosi, a former colleague of mine at NSF. Uh, so she's at the U.S. National Science Foundation, or NSF, where she leads the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, which has a, an annual budget of over one billion U.S. dollars, um, and supports fundamental research and education in computer information science and engineering as well as transformative advances in research infrastructure. Uh, she's actually on leave uh, at NSF from her position at Princeton University, where she is the U. Trumbull Adams Class of 35 Professor of Computer Science. So welcome, uh, Margaret. And I, oh, I will actually turn the stage over to you to tell, tell our webinars about some of the innovations in hardware related to AI. Thank you. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. It's wonderful to have such a rich and diverse set of people in the audience and participating today. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so as Lloyd mentioned, I come here uh, wearing two hats of sorts. So uh, one is that I'm a longtime computing researcher, full on hardware nerd. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the hardware aspects of the topics today. The other is that I am on leave from my computing research uh, faculty position uh, to come into the US National Science Foundation to serve a four-year term leading uh, the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate. And in that role, uh, I really get to up-level and think about computing as a whole, but clearly AI is a key part of it. And so um, what Lloyd and I plan is for me to give a, a brief kind of scene setter in PowerPoints uh, before we start the conversation. So please um, put your questions into the Q&A and I'll be happy to field them as part of what comes next. So uh, let me start with some scene setting on what is NSF. Uh, so NSF uh, is a US government agency that was formed in the aftermath of World War II uh, to be the nation's all of science, basic science research agency. And so while other agencies in the US government like NIH might have a mission to serve a particular topic area like NIH is human health. NSF is encouraged to go broad, everything from astronomy to zoology. And the mission statement is, starts with to promote the progress of science, 
but then has this broadening out around national health prosperity and welfare as well. Um, so with that, I'm gonna make a segue. So I am at the National Science Foundation. The way we work is by funding research that is out in the American um, uh, research community, primarily academic organizations. Um, and the, the organization that I lead, the Computer and Information Science and Engineering or SIZE Directorate at NSF has, as Lloyd said, a budget of about a billion dollars a year. And so we receive proposals in from the academic community and we fund as many meritorious proposals as we can to cover the full space of computing. Uh, we represent about 80% of the uh, federal academic research funding for computer science in America. So that means that when it comes to uh, a lot of different wonderful ideas that have come out of the computer science community over the years, uh, there is an NSF uh, spot for them. And in particular, the Nobel Prize of Computing, if you will, the Turing Award um, has been given out to 72 different individuals. Two thirds of them have received NSF funding at some point in their lives. So even though this is a worldwide award, um, we're very proud of the legacy that we have had in shaping those discoveries and discoverers. So with that, uh, let, me, let me dig in on the nerdy side a little bit. So here we go. You didn't expect me to show a Moore's Law graph perhaps, but that's where I'm going, that's where I'm starting. Um, so what do we have here? We have years across the uh, x-axis and we have orders of magnitude, powers of 10 up the y-axis. And so Gordon Moore uh, back in the 60s took three data points and extrapolated from them the idea that we would be able to double the number of transistors that could cost effectively put on, be put on a single chip every year, year and a half or two years. That, that doubling rate has varied a little bit, but basically the notion that Gordon Moore laid out was that we would be able to stay on an exponential doubling curve generation after generation. And it was incredibly audacious to map that uh, prediction based on three data points in 1964 um, but the darndest thing happened, which is that industry and research got on board and said, let's try to keep this train going. And so for decades, we have been on that kind of a scaling curve. Uh, so just as a reminder of how semi-log plots work, uh, because these are powers of 10 going up the y-axis, an exponential scaling, that doubling rate that I talked about, is going to look like a straight line. And so here you can see these transistor counts, this is from real microprocessor data, transistor counts scaling um, well past 2010 on that doubling rate. Um, so it looks good. And yet, you know, you've, re you've read the news, you know that this notion of the end of Moore's law is something that gets talked about a lot. And so how do we see that in this kind of a graph? Uh, it's coming to an end. You can see it in some of the other indicators. You can see it that while the transistor counts are still going up for now, this what's called the single thread performance, the performance of one uh, uh, execution stream uh, is leveling off. Uh, the power has needed to level off because these things use so much power that you literally cannot cool them anymore. And the other thing is a shift towards uh, what's called parallel execution. So instead of a single, uh, processor that's fetching the next operation and deciding what to do with it. Imagine hundreds, thousands, or millions of processors that are independently or in a coordinated way fetching many different things and deciding what to do with them. This shift is a huge shift. It has shaped everything. It, I always wave my phone at this point. It has shaped the way your phone is designed. It has shaped the way the data center is designed that serves those internet search requests that we all do every day. So it's a massive shift and it may feel like it hasn't affected you personally. It may feel like it hasn't affected AI personally, but that massive shift is both shaping the devices that we use every day and also shaping the future of key trends like AI. Uh, so in particular, 2022, this is what a processor looks like if you zoom in and take a photo of what's inside. A single processor has many different, so a single processor chip has many different uh, execution cores within it. And not only does it have many of them, but it has many 
uh, distinct types, massive heterogeneity. And in particular, one of the things that we've done to be able to stay on a Moore's law scaling curve is we have opted to create more and more specialized hardware units for different tasks. And so essentially every chip, every processor, every computing system you use has AI accelerators within it to try to continue to scale out performance while keeping the power dissipation uh, manageable. And so you see that in this picture of the Apple M1 chip that's uh, out in some of the devices you might be using now uh, with, with a neural engine down here that does some of the AI acceleration for this chip. I could pull out other die photos and show you specialized accelerators for face recognition, uh, for different types of crypto across many different application areas. Specialized accelerators have become the way that we have navigated the end of Moore's law for AI. Nonetheless, this isn't a solved problem. We've essentially created these very increasingly complex systems with increasing heterogeneity or different units on board. And as a result, we have created a new set of, we've solved one problem, scaling Moore's law a little bit longer. Um, we've created new problems, how to program these systems, how to port these systems, how to manage security on these systems, and how to continue to manage the power dissipation of them as, as we go forward. So this is sort of way down low at the hardware, at the sort of individual hardware element level. Um, if you come up high, those, those challenges actually percolate all the way up. Uh, so many AI and machine learning approaches in use today rely on data-driven training. Uh, and so access to data at scale determines who can engage. Fairness and trustworthiness of AI algorithms can depend on the data with which you're tra they're trained. And you're gonna hear about that from some of the, the other speakers today. The other issue, the key issue, uh, one key issue is the degree to which the training phase for AI and machine learning can be incredibly time intensive and power intensive. So if we are relying on data-driven training, we are basically accepting a world in which we're going to spend um, you know, multiple power plants worth of energy to train a system that, for example, knows how to solve a Rubik's cube pro uh, problem. In the aggregate, this means that we have data centers that are uh, 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts, data centers that individually are using more power than entire small cities in the US. Uh, and we have AI systems for which the power, the energy of training those systems um, is extraordinary. So as a computer scientist, uh, my goal is I want AI that's fair, trustworthy, explainable, and beneficial. And I think there's a lot of ways that it can be all of that. I also need for it to be sustainable and energy efficient um, so that we uh, can sort of manage the environmental impacts of this as we go forward. So some of the policy implications that I see to uplevel it uh, uh, further, the role of AI usage trends uh, in turn are sort of shaping policy questions around system security and environmental sustainability. It's fairly often that you're gonna open up a newspaper these days and hear about an AI system that did something someone didn't expect. Uh, and some of those unexpected things have, uh, have safety implications, other unexpected things have security implications and we need uh, to better be able to navigate that space. And so where I am at NSF right now, we have investments in AI safety, investments in trustworthy AI. These are uh, uh, problem areas. These are opportunity areas that are so important that we both put money into specialized programs for them, but we also permeate expectations about those kinds of characteristics throughout everything we invest in. We also have entire programs on designing computing for sustainability. And I, by that, I mean both the energy efficiency of the computing and also the, the overall life cycle cost that actually the carbon footprint of a computer system today is both the energy spent while it's in operation, but also, also the energy spent to design and fabricate that system and eventually to figure out how to properly um, dispose of that system. So these kinds of uh, sort of radiating issues around AI's usage and then the system security and the environmental sustainability have huge policy implications. 
There's also policy implications around democratizing access to AI resources. If to actually help the world advance AI, you need access to really good, scalable, and, and data with sort of equitable representation of many different factors in the problem you're trying to apply AI, AI to. It has to be the case that a broad cross section of the world's talent has access to those data resources and to compute resources to advance on AI. Because if only a small few have access to, to the right AI resources, then it will be ex an exclusionary uh, sort of situation in terms of who can actually help us advance. Uh, we need to think about the healthy production and retention of AI talent in all sectors, industry, academia, research, development, education, policy. Uh, right now, one of the things that we see, and I think this is a global uh, trend that we see, is folks that are leaving academia uh, to go to industry, um, both because of sort of salary differentials between academic AI work and industry AI work, but also because of this previous point about who has access to the resources. If industry is where most of the data is, then we see increasingly AI professionals that are shifting from academia to industry it's wonderful, it keeps advancing many aspects of what we're doing, um, but we have concerns about who's gonna teach the next generation of AI talent in this kind of a world. We need to make sure that there's sort of a broader set of people who can, can um, contribute effectively. Uh, in terms of international collaboration, uh, uh, the US participated in the drafting of the OECD AI principles uh, and participate in the Global Partnership on AI or GPI. And, and so these are examples of a broad set of different international collaborations that are coming around AI because of its implications for so many different aspects of our economy and our society. Um, obviously, I think there's an awful lot of policy implications and there's an awful lot of tech and I can't do justice to either really in 10 minutes. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted to stress was a desire for the cross-pollination of the AI techies and the AI policy folks. The more we can each have conversations together and be informed by each other, the better off we'll be in terms of really thinking about what are AI usage scenarios, how can we think about them ethically, responsibly, and technically to come up with reliable and fair approaches. So uh, I wanted to kind of go through a couple things that NSF is doing. Uh, we are the nation's leading non-defense federal funder of AI research in America. We're proud of that. Uh, and so I can't possibly talk about everything we do in 10 minutes, but I wanted to show a couple slides of things we're working on um, to give that bigger picture. Uh, so, so one thing is over the past three years, we've set up a system of AI institutes around the country. We now have 18 AI institutes with funded footprints in 40 of the 50 US states. Uh, and so each institute is a collaboration among around a dozen universities apiece, um, along with some industry collaborators. Each institute receives around $20 million a year, sorry, $20 million over five years to advance some aspect of AI. Could be trustworthy AI for weather, climate, and coastal oceanography, could be climate smart agriculture and implications of that for AI. Uh, and so on and so forth. So if those AI institutes are these red solar systems that you see on this plot, uh, then what we're doing now is building out around them. Uh, we've funded a virtual organization that's intended to knit the ecosystem together. Uh, we have funded and are continuing to fund a set of international AI partnerships through a set of uh, MOUs with other countries, including Canada, including Italy, and building up that list. Uh, we also have a set of uh, partnership opportunities where each AI Institute was invited to pick a country to collaborate with and propose and get supplemental funding to do that international collaboration. So these international AI partnerships are coming online, both connected to the AI Institutes and to our broader research ecosystem. And the next thing that you'll see are a set of uh, what we're calling equity connectors that are taking other uh, U.S. universities, including uh, minority serving institutions and helping them connect into these AI institutes as well. So stay tuned on that front. So that's one picture I wanted to make sure I got across was this notion of building out an AI research network of networks across uh, the country and with international partnerships as well. 
Uh, the second thing that I wanted to touch on is the National AI Research Resource. Uh, so our US AI Initiative Act a couple of years ago um, asked for us to establish a NAIR task force to look at what it would take, how much would it cost, and how would one build a shared computing and data infrastructure to provide AI researchers and students across many fields with access to a holistic computing ecosystem. Uh, and so this envisioning is well underway. Uh, the interim report of the NAIR task force is out for public uh, observation and comment now um, with a, essentially a, a pretty strong conceptual design of what we'd like to do with the NAIR. Uh, I wanted to stress here the degree to which the goal really is that democratizing access to research and data, democratizing access so anyone can couple in and advance uh, and help advance AI. Um, so we're really hopeful to get the NAIR from sort of task force and interim reports uh, into budget and implementation. And, and uh, that's something you can sort of follow along with as the news comes out over the next uh, months or year. So um, in closing, I, I wanted to show this. When I give a talk that is not, not about AI per se, but about my directorate, the Computing and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, I'll often talk about it in terms of three themes. How do we navigate the end of Moore's law? How do we take on the fact that AI is for everyone and AI is everywhere? And how do we design beneficial socio-technical systems? Now you see the words AI in one of these three themes, um, but I can assure you that AI actually is a part of all of these themes. I showed you how the end of Moore's law trends are actually driving changes in AI. And clearly we are all appreciative of the degree to which trustworthy AI and equity in AI is a key aspect of beneficial socio-technical systems. So with that as teeing up a set of issues and ideas, I'm happy to uh, stop sharing now and uh, go into the Q&A part. Thanks. You are on mute, Lloyd. I think after three years, we'd have mastered this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for a really uh, a really nice overview. Having you know, I had having shared some of the things I was interested in. You covered some of the questions I was going to ask, which is good. So I'll just ask a couple, and then we'll let the the, the panelists uh, ask as well. Um, one one thing that's um, I, I I think as a you know coming from the science side, I'd be interested in is what are some of the kind of new capabilities in AI and data systems that you think might emerge in the next five years or so, or 10 years, as we, as we actually continue to innovate in the hardware side, right? So, uh, you know, there's issues of power and issues of putting uh, that computational power farther, you know, away from data centers and things. And I just sort of, where, where do you see some of those hardware advances um, having an impact on the kind of applications you might see in AI? Sure, so I think within AI itself, I, I think it's interesting to sort of apportion the topic space um, in terms of use inspired or application inspired AI, um, but also this underlying fabric of AI techniques that are quite general and applicable like a Swiss army knife across different um, topic areas. So for example, um, there's an NSF funded researcher, Carla Gomes, who works on this sort of Swiss army knife approach and has come up with AI techniques uh, that are uh, useful for a range of scenarios with, with her emphasis being on AI for the environment, AI for sustainability. So she has a single set of techniques that can both help identify promising uh, molecular and hardware designs for solar fuels and actually different sort of parameter settings but on similar techniques can be used to interpret um, and count bird populations in the Amazon uh, by listening to audio streams and analyzing them automatically. So I think one of the things that I want to get across is the way that underlying AI techniques can actually plug into different societal needs. Within that, um, uh, some of the interesting kinds of uh, more hardware focused trends, uh, one is about the notion of um, AI at the edge. So given the desire to sort of collect data from many sort of widely geographically distributed sensors or information points, 
and analyze it, you might be tempted to kind of grab all the data, send it to your data center, which could be very far away from some of the sensor points and analyze it in one place. Uh, but what we can see is that actually, if you do some of the analysis at the edge, you can save orders of magnitude in the energy cost by downsizing the data and not requiring the energy cost of hop by hop getting it to a data center. At the same time, as you're sort of saving on that hop by hop energy cost, we can also be uh, improving aspects like privacy. If I only send some events away from my phone, or if I blur events before I send them uh, someplace else, uh, I have a different level of assurance about my privacy. And so there's ways that the, the hardware and the notion of sort of distributed data collection can advance both energy goals and privacy goals. Um, there's also some interesting AI work that has to do with what do we do in data constrained situations. Uh, so for example, mixing the more data driven machine learning styles of AI with uh, logic and what's called formal methods or sort of mathematical specifications of a system. And by mixing those two, you can come up with high accuracy techniques that need less uh, uh, data and, and less training and so can be more effective in low data scenarios and also more energy efficient. There's a couple. Yes. So there's actually a question, which is a good follow on, you know, in terms of, um, I'll, I'll rephrase a little bit, but, you know, different um, either device designs or, or, or architectures that would con continue the, you know, keep up with the demands for, you know, machine learning in particular and other techniques, including, you know, the, you know, the interface of how quantum computing might inter interplay in this sort of mixed hardware environment. Uh, so this is a fun question. Yeah. Um, so uh, awesome. So <laughs> I can talk about uh, a few different ways that uh, NSF is looking at this and also how the research community is looking at this. So, um, so one thing that we recognized a few years ago in NSF was the way this end of Moore's law set of trends is causing a seismic shift that doesn't just stop at the transistors, but actually impacts everything up the software stack. Uh, and so we started um, calling for proposals about three years ago for a program called Principles and Practice of Scalable Systems. Everything has an acronym, so that's PPOS. And the, what PPOS does is it says, come to us with a proposal, but you can't just come on your own. It's a sort of transistory level person a hardware level person, maybe a programming languages person and an applications person who come and they say, we want to plug in and take these layers that traditionally have operated separately of each other and connect them and think about application domains. And so that's one of the ways that we're trying to encourage people to think about different kinds of AI accelerators um, or sort of top to bottom solutions for different data analytic uh, kinds of problems. And so now it's been a couple of years we have people funded to look at um, this full stack approach for genomics and, and other topic areas. So that's on the, if you will, the non-quantum, the classical computing side, um, but it really encourages this full stack approach. Uh, another set of investments that we make are about new technologies. And so we do invest in quantum, both quantum computing, quantum sensing, and so forth. And there can be a role um, for uh, people certainly envision interplays between AI and quantum both ways, actually. Uh, so people envision ways that quantum computing might eventually be reliable and scalable enough uh, to solve AI and optimization problems well. And conversely, uh, people are also doing research on how AI techniques can actually help us um, uh, compile and synthesize better quantum computing uh, uh, program streams uh, to better make use of the quantum prototypes that we have available now. Um, there's also work that NSF supports in other novel new technology areas beyond classical and quantum. So for example, if you see AI as being a very data intensive and um, long-term data-driven kind of field, which some aspects of it are, then um, one of the things that people are looking at are, are notions of using DNA as a storage technology. It's got incredible long-term storage capabilities and we have every motivation in the world to keep knowing how to read DNA because it is us and 
for a whole bunch of medical reasons, we need to be able to read DNA. So unlike other storage technologies where the, the formatting and so forth changes over time, uh, DNA storage has those attributes that are promising as well. So we fund research in novel technologies that go well beyond uh, classical and quantum into DNA and so forth. That's great. So I, I, another great question, which is, was also on my list anyway, um, um, so just to just generally talk about uh, the ways in which um, NSF engages internationally, uh, you know, and, and ways in which NSF funded institutions can interact internationally. Obviously, we have a lot of flow of students back and forth, but um, um, and I know, you know NSF has some limitations in funding, but there can you just talk a little bit about it as you, you alluded to some of the international partnerships and the way that NSF research NSF and NSF funded researchers engage in AI uh, uh, around the world? Sure, I'm trying to do two things at once, which okay. is always dangerous. I'm trying to put something into the chat. Okay. Uh, so okay. I just put into the chat a link to the different size international partnerships. And if I have another moment, I'll put in our Office of International Science and Engineering for all of NSF. So um, I think one of the things that we all know as scientists is that uh, collaborations come in all forms. And uh, as the, one of the amazing things about working in science for as long as I have is the amazing people that I've met and worked with all around the world. And so what we do at NSF is try to hear where the community sees opportunities for those kinds of international collaborations and then do what we can to support them. Um, we have a range of international partnerships that already exist. And if you sort of click through, thanks Lloyd for adding that really. If you sort of click through the links, what you'll see is that a common model uh, is uh, where someone from the US and someone from not in the US write a proposal together. It's one document, it's one set of ideas. Uh, and we have opportunities where uh, they can and send that proposal through what's called the lead agency agreement mechanism. The US side will have NSF take it through its no, our normal merit review process with members of the research community, uh, considering it, scoring it, and so forth. Uh, at the end, if it's recommended for funding, the US researchers will be funded from uh, NSF, and the folks on the other side will be funded by their uh, science agency in their country. And so we have these kinds of collaborative lead agency agreements with a range of countries. With the AI institutes in particular, uh, we actually used an even broader approach. We knew that there were probably opportunities and desires for collaboration that went way beyond countries with whom we've formally signed, you know, memoranda of understanding and created this mechanism. And so we said, you go find your collaborators um, we're offering funding for the U.S. side because that's what we can that's what we can do with our federal dollars. Um, but if your collaborators have a way to be funded for their side by industry, by their their local science agency, we, uh, you know we welcome that. We can't fund it, but we're welcome to sort of uh, encourage the collaboration and fund the U.S. side. Um, the other thing is we have a set of international research experiences for students and other kinds of programs that actually fund the back and forth uh, travel of research. I realize what we've learned over the past three years is maybe we can do a lot of collaborations without the back and forth travel, but gosh, being in person is a, is a way better way to sort of, you know, sort of figure things out on a whiteboard and all of that. So there's, there's still plenty of opportunities for the back and forth travel kind of funding as well. And I, I also know that, you know, g given the international background of, of the current NSF director, he's very interested in, you know, in, in cooperating around the world with different countries. And I know there's a lot of number of high level agreements with different countries in the science space and, and, and even in the AI space, I think, specifically. Yeah. So and in particular, uh, he and one of the division directors from from my directorate from size just got back from a trip to India um, that is part of a burgeoning partnership between AI and India. We do have over 30 recent awards that are um, partnerships between NSF funded researchers in the US and uh, researchers in India funded through some of their technology centers. So that's a great uh, new and growing example. And I, I think you'll see a lot more there. There was an incredible response when we put out the call for those supplements. 
so I, I think I, I just if anyone in the wants to get one last question in the chat um, quickly otherwise I think we're I'll, I'll give everyone another second if whoever gets the a last question I'll get it answered <laughs> and otherwise I I'll wait another minute see if anyone has something they want to ask or even just um, speak up up uh, I think one I, well, I, I okay well, I'll, I'll rephrase one I, I maybe I missed that one okay um, AI is everywhere and should be everyone but most people are probably not aware of the implication how can how can beneficial socio technical systems to be oops oh, sorry <laughs> be developed if most people are not aware of them so this is this because I think the question is you know the, how does NSF and how can other other governments and other parts around the world make the public aware uh you know a public aware of ai what it means and and what they should know so i think i think we'll kind of end with that one sure um it's 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 a great question and it's a challenging undertaking i, I think science communications in general is is super important and super challenging right um whenever i think about coming to a, a government agency like this you, you look out at the people that you see in your neighborhood or in your supermarket and you say why should they care? Why should they want their tax dollars to go to this? We can see benefits, but it's it's on us to be able to explain benefits and explain implications of technology. And and I think um, one of the things that the AI community and the CS community in general is is increasingly aware of and needs to be aware of is it's not enough to say I could do this with my technology. It's it's important to say should I do this with my technology? and to get into those kinds of questions. Now, how can we uh, educate them? That's, that's challenging. Uh, I think there are things that you can sort of bring through in uh, elementary school environments. I think one of the things that, that I've been really heartened by is the degree to which um, robotics teams and robotics clubs have become such a gateway for so many different people around the world to come into AI, into computing and so forth. And so I think that's a place where you could imagine the robotics teams talking not just about how much fun it is to have a robot play soccer, but also like, you know, what would happen if these robots were the size of cars and that crash just happened? You know, there's ways to broach these topics. And I, I think um, uh, engaging folks early on in some of these issues and then bringing them along at different uh, sort of expertise levels is, is super important. So thank you for asking that question. So thanks. I think with that, we're going to close out this session. Uh, and thank you, Margaret, so much. This is a lot of fun. Great to see you again. And, uh, and I'm going to pass the baton to back to Julia for our next thank section. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks again to Margaret for joining for that great presentation. Um, I'm now going to be introducing Lisa Amini, who is um, a researcher with IBM Research. We're really looking forward to having you here today and speaking about your work. Um, so I'm going to give the floor to Lisa to speak a little bit and give us her presentation. After that, we're going to open up for questions in the same way that we did before with Margaret. So please do be thinking of questions during her presentation and feel free to drop them in the chat box. And with that, I will hand it to you, Lisa, to introduce yourself and begin your presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Julia, and uh, welcome everyone. Hello, I'm uh, Lisa Amini, I'm from IBM. Uh, I'm the director of our IBM Research Cambridge Lab. Um, I also lead our AI scaling and automation uh, research initiative. So that's a, a worldwide initiative across our research labs. And finally, I lead our AI Horizons uh, program, Horizons Network program, which is our network of our major partnerships uh, with, uh, with academic uh, partners. So, uh, you know, uh, there's our MIT IBM lab, we have partnership with, with Mila, UIUC, uh, and even some international IIT and uh, Stuttgart and, and, and in Brazil, so Sao Paulo. So, um, so that's uh, my background. Before getting into my topic, I, I am going to focus on sort of this intersection of that leading edge of data and AI. So not just AI, but really giving a, hopefully a really strong data flavor uh, to, to that. So um, just a quick uh, reminder in case uh, anyone is, is not aware, IBM uh, is uh, our technology. What we do is we're a technology company. We focus on uh, enterprise technologies for enterprises. So we're not a 
a B2C or a B2B. Um, uh, a huge part of our strategy is hybrid cloud. So ensuring that uh, our the, the companies that we provide technology to are able to uh, do their computation both in the cloud and, and on-prem. Uh, we build uh, fundamental AI uh, capabilities uh, as well as embedded into uh, applications, products, uh, help our customers to and embed it and, and so on. Uh, we build, uh, we contribute um, extensively uh, to open source and an underpinning for all we do is uh, trust. Uh, include, you know, some technologies directly towards trust, um, but embedded uh, throughout how we actually um, go about building technology. Um, just as sort of, you know, looking at some of the numbers, right? So uh, Red Hat is an IBM uh, business, more than 94% of Fortune 500 uh, use Red Hat, 40% of Fortune 500 uh, use our cloud packs, nearly 70% use Elias uh, Security, 100% uh, of top 10 companies are in major industries are IBM Consulting. Um, you know, 90% of the uh, top uh, 50 banks run on IBM Z. Uh, so the death of the mainframe is a little bit uh, premature in terms of uh, announcements that you know that really started happening. I think in the in the 80s. Obviously, it's it's continues to be a transformational uh, business. But this is sort of a, an overview of what we do at IBM, um, and then in IBM Research. Um, IBM Research uh, is a 3,000 uh, researchers uh, worldwide, so we are a research division actually that's separate from all of our product divisions so that we really uh, can focus on our mission of uh, advancing science and technology. We consider it advancing it for IBM and for the, for the world. Our, you know, we aspire our researchers. Um, uh, basically uh, aspire to the same sorts of, uh, you know, approaches that uh, academics uh, would. So um, doing leading edge research, publishing it in top conferences and, and journals, uh, you know, being recognized hopefully um, by the range of, you know, uh, you know, best papers, seminal papers. Uh, we even have been uh, recognized with uh, very high awards in terms of Nobel laureates, uh, Medals of Technology, National Medals of Science, uh, Turing Awards, um, and so uh, we're, we're obviously very proud of our of our research uh, division and and this and, and very happy that we're actually able to do this in sort of this uh, you know joint uh, you know industry commercial uh, and then partnering very well uh, with with academia. Okay, so now I want to switch and uh, just quickly give you uh, what, what do I mean when I say that uh, my research agenda is on uh, scaling and automating AI. Uh, so uh, one of the things to consider is that when people are creating AI, uh, it's a very, uh, it can be a very challenging uh, process to try to, uh, you know, understand, okay, you know, which data, which features of that data, how might they be transformed? How would I parameterize um, these, you know, neural networks that, uh, you know, the people are leveraging for, uh, for deep learning. So we, uh, one of the technologies that we focus on is AI that basically will automate the, will look at data and automate that process of finding the best uh, network, the best parameters, uh, you know, the best features and, and, and so on. Um, part of that uh, includes uh, being able to bring in uh, elements of, of trust. So uh, I think one of the other challenges maybe people at least in the AI field realize is that it's very difficult to, to keep up, right? If you look at you know, the new algorithms and how they're adapting um, every day, it's, it's a very fast paced uh, field. And that's, that's in the algorithms themselves. But then when you add on top of that, okay, how do I ensure that I am tackling you know, uh, fairness, uh, bias, explainability, and all these other things that ensure that people can uh, trust the, the outputs of, of both uh, what we do to generate the, um, the AI pipelines, as well as the AI models that are then created from those AI pipelines. So we invest significantly uh, as well in terms of algorithms uh, to help with that, um, you know, uh, fairness, bias, um, causality, explainability, all of these sorts of things. And then uh, finally, it's about scale, right? So uh, it's important that these algorithms um, scale uh, for many reasons, obviously people don't want to wait a long time uh, for uh, their results to, to come. Uh, but another reason obviously is that if we are not 
looking at the performance efficiency of these, uh, then what happens is it continues to consume more and more uh, you know, uh, compute, which is more and more energy. So it's critical that we are always looking at and trying to improve the scalability of the algorithms themselves. Um, and then finally, we are looking at uh, scale in terms of uh, distribution. So for example, um, because of data requirements, many of our customers would not want to uh, move their data from maybe distributed uh, geographies uh, into a central site, uh, maybe it's GDPR, maybe it's bandwidth or any of these other things. Um, so we work on uh, techniques that are referred to as federated learning so the data can stay in place. Uh, and yet we can uh, you know, train a model that is able to benefit from all that data that may be very widely um, distributed. So, so that's sort of the background of what uh, that I'm working on. And now what I'd like to do is now I'll tackle the, the topic in terms of this intersection of, of data and AI. So um, I'm noticing that I'm getting the admits into the room uh, still, Julia. So you may want to tackle them. So, okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of AI, right? So you know, we I think many of us uh, are aware of this, right? So when we first started, uh, you know, the original ideas, you know, around the expert systems. Uh, those were all basically manually coded, uh, you know, rules and, and facts that had to be brought into the system. And, you know, that was originally in the 80s, and there was this great expectation in terms of that this could, could change the world, but then, you know, it, it leveled off and, and we needed to look for other methods. Uh, you know, you know, post the 80s, what started happening is just growing volumes of, of data. And so much more attention on uh, statistical techniques, uh, pattern recognition types of, of techniques, so SVM and so on. So that was sort of the, the rise of machine learning. So uh, the ability to learn from the data as opposed to manually crafting uh, facts and rules and, and these sorts of things. Um, and then what started happening around uh, 2010, obviously, was this... Uh, even more data, even more uh, compute, and uh, breakthroughs that made us realize that if we really trained with all of that data, we could get much better results. We could have breakthroughs in terms of vision, um, speech, uh, natural language. And so you saw this real focus in terms of, of deep learning. Um, there's something that's happening uh, right now. It actually, uh, it started in 2017, uh, but this is clearly continuing well beyond that. And that is that um, the challenge here was that while we had more data, we could get much more uh, precise, accurate uh, models uh, for a specific task. Uh, we were suffering from, from several things. One is that uh, they were trained for a task. And when you tried to transfer them to some new task, uh, they would fail. And you needed to go and get the data for that task. Um, secondly, what was happening is that uh, the data, there's and, and, and some of this still exists, but the point was that the other thing that was slowing down uh, movement in the in the field uh, was there was a lot of work to sort of craft that data to, to label it uh, to you know provide supervision such that the uh, you know the machines could could learn from it and, and so on. So uh, those things were really uh, creating sort of a you know a, you know a leveling off yet yet again I would say. Uh, and then around 2017, uh, new architectures came out, transformer-based architectures came out, uh, and techniques that would enable self-supervision, right? So self-supervision means uh, instead of having to label a bunch of data, if we can find signal within the data uh, that would help us to train and understand what's happening, um, then that would uh, greatly alleviate the need for kind of the human burden of getting all of this data ready uh, for, for the um, uh, for the training process. Um, that requires uh, even more massive data, even more uh, uh, compute. But the advantage that we get from it is that with these models, uh, we were then able to train very large, uh, very rich models that would, could then be applied to multiple tasks. And that is a very, uh, a very big deal, right? So both, both of those two things are, are very important. And what's happening is that uh, so, you know, this kind of started in 2017. Uh, it's really uh, broadened and it's having a huge impact on, in my opinion, sort of the future of both AI and, and data, right? So I want to, to drill down more into kind of beyond, uh, you know, and, and what's happening uh, now and, and beyond with these, uh, what are referred to as, as foundation models or transformer-based uh, models. Okay, so... 
Uh, first thing to realize is that with the self-supervision uh, techniques, uh, what's happening is that um, the opportunities are going well beyond just uh, language and vision. So, uh, you know, the, um, it started with language and vision, um, but keep in mind that these are being trained on, you know, massive amounts of, of language data, and they can be trained multimodal. So language plus uh, images, for example. Um, so being able to, for example, with this sort of a you know, a, a foundation uh, model or, you know, large language uh, models being able to, for example, provide a prompt, uh, you know, an armchair in the shape of an uh, uh, avocado imitating an avocado and have the system actually be able to uh, generate uh, images uh, that well represent this. So it's not in the old world, we would have retrieved uh, images, uh, you know, from some uh, storage, you know, here what it's doing is it's actually uh, generating images. Obviously, it's learning from other images that it's seen, but it is uh, generating uh, images. Um, you know, secondly, you know, uh, there's there's language. So being able to, you know, these foundation models basically are able to tackle, uh, you know, not only uh, question answering, which is something, you know, we became familiar with, with, you know, Jeopardy and, and these sorts of uh, systems. Uh, it's able to, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, being able to write uh, poetry and, and prose and, you know, and write in different styles, uh, depending on what's being, uh, what it's being prompted uh, to do. And because these, these are basically what's, what the systems have gotten very good at is basically what we would refer to in the field as sequence to sequence learning. So uh, being able to uh, learn from many different sequences, essentially a language of what that data is, uh, and then be able to, uh, you know, create other sequences uh, from that. So what's another uh, sequence? Uh, another sequence, uh, for example, is uh, the language of, of, of you know, of, of, of chemistry, of, of proteins, of, of molecules, right? So uh, we're able to take, uh, you know, sequence data from these and be able to uh, generate potentially uh, new uh, sequences that might adhere to properties that we're trying to um, to espouse within those molecules or proteins. Obviously, that has a big effect. Or a hope, uh, you know, we hope that it will have you know, huge effects in terms of you know, in, in medicine, um, new materials, um, and, and so on. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, think of code, right? Uh, code has its own language, so being able to train from massive amounts of, of code uh, that we can find and open in public sources. Uh, and then uh, from a prompt, uh, be able to generate code. So prompt, think of it as sort of, you know, a context. It could be, you know, a, a sentence uh, or it could be, uh, you know, a position in code. So being able to autocomplete uh, code for, uh, for humans as well as being able to generate it uh, from prompt. Um, so, the, so we see huge potentials uh, in this sort of new uh, combination of being able to uh, self-supervise uh, on the data, being able to train very large, very rich models, uh, and then be able to apply them to, uh, to, to different tasks. Okay, um, so let me uh, just talk a little bit more about those, uh, the key breakthroughs and the data implications of that, right? So uh, I talked about being able to do self-supervised learning from unlabeled data. Uh, used to what would happen is that, for example, if we wanted to do anything, then humans would have to literally go through, you know, uh, images and try to say, okay, this is a cat or a dog, or, you know, and try to circle objects within images. And so it's now it's, it's, it's kind of amazing that, you know, so much was invested in that uh, when uh, this new breakthrough in terms of self-supervised, what it's doing is if you think of a sentence, right, it has a sequence of, of words, uh, can you uh, train a model by trying to just predict the, predict, uh, the next word? Uh, in the sentence? Can you train uh, through predicting backwards in time? Can you train uh, using uh, missing uh, words? And you can do the same thing in images, right? You can imagine ablating uh, portions of the, the images, uh, ablating uh, portions of the, you know, descriptive uh, information about images and so on. So uh, it, what it does is it sort of opens the door uh, for just massive amount of data that now uh, is usable uh, for training these models that before it just wasn't usable because there was no way we could label that much um, data. Uh, the, the second part that, that I mentioned in terms of the data, uh, big data implications for this is that now uh, we are, the systems are getting better and better at training on a variety of different types of, of data. So text, 
uh, images, uh, code, three D signals. So a variety of different types of images. Just trying to you know think of it as trying to consume all the data they can find. It does take that work of figuring out how you would do the self supervision, uh, but then now you can adapt it to a variety of, of, of different uh, use cases and, 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 and text. So we're talking things like you know, question answering, sentiment analysis, information extraction, image captioning, image recognition. And so this is, this is a huge change in the, uh, in the, in the field. And, and, and what it means is that it, it, it changes the way we think about uh, data. We think about you know, much larger sets of data. We think less about labeling the data. We think about um, how, what are innovative techniques to try to self-supervise uh, within uh, those uh, data forms. Uh, and we think about applying uh, what those models have learned to other data to help us to understand it and improve how, we, uh, how we're able to, to leverage um, that data. Okay, so it's also important because one of the things that we've seen is that you know, with speech and learning, you know, the first, the first uh, deep learning, what we saw is that, okay, when they first came out, uh, frankly, you know, the models weren't uh, doing that well, but, you know, we continue to work on it, sort of like, you know, the, the exponential uh, curves that, uh, you know, that uh, were being talked about in the previous uh, presentation, we suddenly see barriers um, starting to drop. So, so you're going to see the same thing right now, right? You'll, you'll see a lot of information in terms of saying, okay, well, these are the weaknesses of, you know, uh, you know, BERT or GPT or these things, you know, uh, but what will happen is that uh, over time, you will start to see these same sorts of barriers start to come down for these other uh, domains, AI for code and uh, AI for uh, materials discovery. Um, and so, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's really changing and, and it's creating for data, it's creating the sort of, uh, you know, um, how can we, you know, train on all of the publicly available data that we might be able to amass. And then how can we bring it into the context of an enterprise uh, with much less data and adapt it to, uh, to the problems in the enterprise? Because that's one difference. So something that works on open data doesn't necessarily work in the enterprise. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. Okay, so example uh, GPT-3, just to kind of make it all uh, concrete in case this isn't uh, your field, right? So uh, this is an example of a, you know, a chatbot uh, conversation uh, with uh, a particular large language uh, model, GPT-3, uh, was trained on 45 terabytes of training data. So basically, common crawl is basically just going across the entire internet, uh, all of Wikipedia, you know, repositories of books, and so on. Um, the other thing that's, that's really important to note is this uh, so parameters, right? This is a 75 billion parameter model, right? And so that kind of goes back to what I was introducing when I first started the talk of, we have to have methods that help to, you know, automate this entire process because there's, there's just no way that, that humans can, uh, can do this. Obviously a lot of those are set by the data and the training, but even for that to be successful, there's additional parameters that, that have to be set. Um, these are just examples of, you know, with GPT, of uh, uh, types of tasks that GPT is, uh, you know, pre-trained uh, to, to take on and, and demonstrate. Uh, uh, what you're starting to hear the rise of is uh, what they refer to as zero shot, one shot, and few shot training. Uh, basically with a zero shot, uh, what we do is um, you only need to prompt the system. I want you to translate from English to French, right? That's the prompt. Uh, and then you give it a word, cheese, that's the prompt, and it will uh, translate to French. So nothing more than that, no adaptation to, uh, you know, uh, to, to the French language and, and so on. So it's not working, I, I wouldn't say it works perfectly for every language, but just, you know, you have to think about kind of these sort of the beginnings of what you're starting to see and it will get better and better. One shot means, okay, well, I'll tell you it's translating English to French, but maybe I need to give you an example, or maybe I need to give you a couple of examples. Um, but this dramatically sort of changes the way that we think about uh, leveraging data, uh, building these uh, building these machines. Okay, uh, what about structured data, right? So, so far I've been talking about, uh, you know, language data, image, you know, so what people refer to as unstructured data. Uh, but if you think about, you know, what companies are built out, how they, how companies operate, 
a lot of that is what they would refer to as um, structured data. So think of it as, as tabular uh, data. So uh, invoices, uh, products, uh, you know, customer information. So the things you would traditionally find in databases, data warehouses, data lakes, or in these open forums. So data.gov or you know, Wikidata uh, has tables and, and so on. It's huge amounts of data. And what you might not realize is that while this looks pretty good, right? I mean, as a human, I can understand what's in this uh, table, um, but a machine being actually able to take this sort of a table and leverage it to make computations or reason about GDP, it's, it's actually very uh, challenging. They have to understand uh, the regions, uh, you know, CNY, uh, uh, what is CNY, right? So there's a lot of work to try to bring this into a space where uh, humans can do it and today, a lot of that is handled, uh, you know, by what we refer to as, as data wrangling uh, techniques. Uh, you know, it's data engineers, data analysts, uh, a lot of manual labor to try to uh, bring that into space. So we anticipate uh, that this will be a next space that will get opened up by these foundation models and will completely change how we think about data and the types of data that we can leverage, right? So. Let me uh, give you a couple of examples, right? So, uh, you know, this uh, recent paper, Can Foundation Models uh, Wrangle Your Data? So it's showing uh, four tasks that today are using basically almost some of the old, you know, if then else in, in some cases, uh, types of, you know, logics that have been manually created or humans making uh, data imputation uh, corrections and these sorts of things. Uh, can we re-leverage these foundation models, uh, do that same sort of prompting, right? Uh, is there an error in country uh, for this particular uh, field in a table and being able to get an answer from that? Maybe we need to do you know, a few shot uh, where we give it a couple of examples. This is a very big deal in terms of data. Um, another uh, example is another good reference to, to try to look at this is this kind of a survey across many different types of uh, techniques that are being used to try to conquer uh, tabular data. And, I just wanted to sort of give you an example of why this is so, so difficult and so important, right? So the um, the uh, so so this is what a table might look like, right? You have these uh, you have uh, you know columns and you have rows and you have these uh, column headers that tell you what's in here. Okay, um, you know, frankly, for most of the machine learning algorithms, if they didn't, they they work on statistical properties and. They don't look at the they don't look at the heading in order to do that, right? So they just go and say, okay, which data is actually going to provide me a better model, uh, and then how do I how do I use those features? How do I compute against them? Um, that actually can be a little bit dangerous because that means that we're generating features that uh, we don't exactly know. We may not know uh, what was that data field. We may not know how it's being combined, um, and so there are challenges with the current kind of state of the art, not really knowing or caring about this, right? Uh, humans care about it, right? If they were to come up with information, they would want to know, uh, for example, uh, that, uh, you know, what, uh, how these are being computed, because maybe it makes a difference on, you know, not only explainability and then trusting in the model, but it also can make a difference in terms of, is this an okay thing uh, to do uh, in terms of uh, making these calculations and computations based off kind of the semantics of the data, maybe privacy or, or other, you know, uh, bias, fairness, equity types of, of issues. So, what we're able to do, like I was saying earlier, is we're starting to be able to learn from the combination of just vast uh, resources, you know, Wikidata, Table Corpora, you know, think of that same sort of common crawl, but instead of going after language, we're going after tables, data. Uh, there's some structured information we can find in resources like BDpedia. Um, and suddenly what we're able to do is we're able to uh, recognize, uh, for example, that, okay, this is a person, uh, the patient is actually a person, um, they have a height and they have a weight. Um, there is a relationship between height and weight, uh, BMI and, and disease. And so understanding this uh, basically can help us to find uh, better features to make those features better explainable. But, you know, we're in the process. So, so I expect to see, you know, big breakthroughs in terms of our ability to go in and kind of grab and, 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 uh, make good use of uh, this type of, of, of data. So, um, you know, I, I, the reason I wanted to bring this out is because I think it's somewhat of a, you know, uh, what we're starting to see is good and hopefully virtuous cycles uh, in terms of AI and, and data, right? So this growth in terms of 
openly available data, I was just mentioning, not just um, openly available and enterprise data that can be used uh, for uh, machine learning. It's not just uh, text, it's code, it's documents, uh, uh, tables, and so on. Uh, bringing these into these new foundation or transformer uh, based models, leveraging that so that we have new understanding of, of code and data and the ability to generate even more uh, and bring that uh, back into the system. So I think this is um, exciting from kind of that thinking about the leading edge of, of data uh, for many reasons. Um, there are risks, obviously. Uh, you've seen a lot of this press in terms of uh, this is just uh, one example. Uh, we've also seen, uh, you know, uh, kind of other examples in terms of saying, okay, well, there is intrinsic, uh, you know, bias in the training sources. Uh, uh, as we're training the model, we can't necessarily get rid of uh, those intrinsic uh, biases. Uh, and then what can happen is not only do you have, uh, you know, failures of the, the model, but uh, potentially extrinsic harm, right? So, uh, representing bias, uh, performance disparities, abuse, stereotypes, and so on. So the, re the risks are very real uh, and, and, and remaining, right? Um, another uh, risk is misuse, right? If suddenly you're able to just, you know, generate, uh, you know, tasks, I mean, generate uh, language and generate positions, uh, you know, position types of statements, um, you know, <laughs> much greater ability to scale, uh, you know, fake news, fake profiles, uh, you know, abuse and, and these sorts of things. Um, and, 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 and the list goes on, right? So uh, environment in terms of, you know, just a lot of compute, right? So we're consuming a lot of resources by, and a lot of energy uh, by doing this. There's the legality of it, you know, liability. Who, who's liable for these, these models, right? Who owns uh, these models? Because obviously they're trained uh, with the data from, uh, from vast uh, sources. Uh, there's the ethics of, of scale, right? So the point is that um, in order to train these models, uh, one has to have access to huge uh, compute resources and data and so on. So not every company, not every country uh, may have access uh, to that. Um, and then there's the economics aspect of it as well. Obviously, uh, you know, the expectation is for huge uh, increases in productivity and in innovation uh, from these uh, models. So uh, what you're starting to hear more about is the, the rise of uh, responsible AI. It's actually not new. Uh, you know, in 2016, there was this partnership of AI uh, where, you know, recognizing what was happening with uh, deep learning and, and data and so on, um, and, and recognizing, you know, as they were being put in use and, and more people were inspecting them that they were seeing issues with fairness and bias and so on. So. I uh, uh, founded this, uh, this partnership. Um, the reason I sort of wanted to point these out is because I think these are good sources for understanding uh, what are some of the issues, what, you know, how might we uh, better manage uh, these, uh, uh, the risk uh, be more uniform uh, in doing so. Um, IBM, you know, has also, you know, we've put open source toolkits out there. We're not the only one. So there's toolkits so that you don't have to start from, you know, from people don't have to start from scratch. They can go out, they can find the latest algorithms in, in fairness. Uh, they can, you know, in uncertainty quantification and, and privacy and all of these things that can helpfully make these models more uh, trustworthy. Uh, but it's not just about the, um, you know, the, uh, the algorithms themselves, it's, it's use. A big part of this is how do they actually uh, get used? Um, this is an area, it's, it's continuing to mature. Like I said, the language has evolved some. We started off with things like ethics and trustworthy AI and so on. It's evolved much more to responsible AI, which I think, uh, you know, better embodies uh, the use of it. Uh, so now you're starting to see, you know, case studies of companies like IBM and Microsoft and, you know, how do we you know, how are we doing it against those goals of more trustworthy, more responsible um, AI? So uh, this also is a, a, you know, a really exciting um, space for us. So uh, I will end with a, with a cartoon. Uh, and uh, I think it, it goes to show that, you know, while we are, you know, we're, we're certainly serious about, you know, the technology and, and ensuring uh, that is being put to, to good use and that it's benefiting society, it will continue to be uh, a challenge, obviously. So with that, I'll start. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, I'm gonna turn now to a couple of audience questions that we have. Um, I'm seeing two here, one from Esteban and one from Juan. Um, I'll start with Esteban's question. So uh, you mentioned complex deep learning models require more labeled data and self-supervised techniques are getting more traction. 
However, if there's less human intervention in that type of learning, how do we ensure that self-supervised learning remains bias-free and trustworthy? Yeah, so actually the, um, uh, the point is that the, the bias types of algorithms, what they're doing is they are, uh, they're not necessarily doing that based off of, um, uh, you know, labels uh, within the data, right? So they're looking for, for example, there are other ways of doing that. So you can say, okay, well, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, uh, you know, classify to decide whether or not I would give uh, someone uh, a loan, okay? Uh, well, what I can do is I can look at all the different, uh, the, the algorithm and as part of building the model, uh, we can look across, okay, what are the different features that we might use? Uh, for those sets, you know, is there disparities? Uh, you know, for example, am I seeing that, you know, for example, you know, women are women in, you know, or, you know, people that are living in certain geographies or of certain age or these sorts of things. So these are all properties. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, what we'd like to do is we would like to see you know, uh, good fairness uh, across, or we'd like to be able to, or, or have the system go back to the human and say, hey, you know, what I'm seeing in the data is, you know, you tend to approve loans much more for people that are in these categories, and you tend to reject them for this. So making uh, that more uh, both uh, so that we're able to, you know, Bring that information back, detect it, as well as to explain it. So that's not necessarily using labeled data, but on the other hand, it is using some of these uh, things that I was talking about before, right? If, if you don't know what those fields are, if they're just numbers, uh, then it's hard to, to explain to the, to the human, uh, you know, why this might not be a, a good thing. Otherwise, they're just kind of saying, hey, with these features, you know, this is how you're doing it. So that's why it's really important for us to sort of kind of go back and be able to, uh, to, 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 to label, yeah. Yeah, and then and, and this, goes, and this goes beyond. So I, I think the point is that there are ways for us with self-supervised uh, to um, tackle these uh, problems. But I think what we suffer from the most is that it's a very fast moving field. I mean, people, you know, breakthroughs every day and, um, you know, trying to continue to, you know, look at these and ensure that, you know, we are able to, to tackle those problems. And, and it's hard, it, it is hard, right? Bias, uh, you know, fairness, uncertainty, quantification, hard topics. Um, Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I'm now gonna turn to the question from Juan, which was dropped in the chat, um, just basically on, you know, what are the risks of opening up the door to broader access to AI systems that could be used for harm? For example, deep fakes, NLP systems for harassment, that kind of thing. What can be done to kind of prevent or address that? Right, yeah. So um, uh, two things, right? I mean, uh, uh, GPT, you know, uh, in terms of GPT-3, uh, the latest version of it, right? And some of these models, what's happening is that, uh, you know, the, the creators are actually uh, deciding not necessarily to uh, release the, the code, uh, but to release interfaces uh, to it so that it can be, um, you know, used without necessarily having people go and take the technology, kind of reuse it, uh, repurpose it uh, for bad. Um, so um, there are steps that we can take uh, such that, you know, you're not necessarily, you know, you're not necessarily uh, able to uh, bring in training data such that you poison the model uh, with additional bias. Uh, so there's, there are uh, methods for trying to uh, tackle um, these. Um, but it, I, I, you know, I think that it's probably important that we not try to sugarcoat it, and that we realize that um, there is there is big uh, potential uh, for this um, for this type of harm, and you know, we will we'll really need to ensure that uh, the people that are creating uh, these technologies are standing up to that uh, to that challenge, and and that we, you know, are holding them responsible for that. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, I think was really good is that, you know, something gets new, it gets released, and, you know, people go after it, and they're trying to figure out, you know, how they, they break it, and, and what they might do, and what kind of uh, challenges it might have. And, um, you know, um, I, think that's, I think that's a very healthy and good thing, because I can assure you that, you know, as those attacks are happening, you know, <laughs> you know the researchers are, are very much, you know, jumping in that and trying to, to help it. The technology providers are looking at, okay, what should I be uh, doing uh, differently? You know, the policy uh, writers are looking at, okay, how might I better uh, control this? So I think one of the, the big advantages we have is that it is, it is an area where people are kind of uh, excited and, and challenged by it, and they tend to, to jump in there. And then that's a, that's a very good thing um, to be pointing these things out. 
because it, it will continue. It, 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 it will continue because it's like, it's like when people are attacking, uh, you know, uh, doing, uh, you know, uh, you know, attacks, you know, ransom attacks on, on computers. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not, it's not AI. It's, it's, it's technology. It's, it's, it's human nature uh, to a certain extent. And so it's going to continue to happen. And so we, we just have to make sure that we're, you know, that we're really on top of that. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, a great and very realistic perspective on the issue. So thank you for that, Lisa. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'm going to give one more minute. If anyone wants to raise their hand or drop a question in the chat box, please do that now. Um, while I wait for that, I'm going to go ahead and give a brief intro into the next section. Um, Emily is going to be leading a couple of presentations from participants in the AI Connect network. We're really looking forward to having, um, you know, actual participant engagement in the presentation portions of these webinars. Um, this is the first time that we're doing that in this format, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, so thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I think we can probably arrange to maybe share some slides after this because your, your presentation was really phenomenal, very interesting. Okay. And um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Emily. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily, like Julia said. Um, I have not had a chance to introduce myself yet, so I'm a pro uh, program assistant, excuse me, with the Geotech Center. Um, and, you know, I, I have the pleasure of moderating our next panel on local case studies in AI data collection, distribution, equity, et cetera. And we have some wonderful panelists that are here to speak with us. Uh, so I am joined this morning by Dr. Juan David Gutierrez of Colombia, who is an associate professor of international political and urban studies at the Universidad del Rosario, as well as by Dr. Shelley Radwan of Egypt, a computer and biomedical engineer who is currently the artificial intelligence advisor to the Egyptian Minister Ministry of Communications and Information Technology. So thank you again both so much for joining us this morning. I think I can speak for everyone to say how excited I am to, to learn more about uh, the role of data in your respective countries and your work with AI. Um, again, the audience can expect um, Q&A at the end of some presentations uh, from our two panelists who also happen to be AI Connect members, which we're very excited about. Um, and all right, so uh, yeah, without further ado, Juan, I will turn it over to you for an introduction. Well, thank you very much, Emily, for um, hosting this uh, panel and everyone, uh, the attendants, and of course, the Geotech Center. Um, well, I'm, I'm gonna speak about transparency, algorithmic transparency um, in my country. And it um, basically uh, is related with, with the research I'm conducting in, in, um, in Colombia about artificial intelligence systems and uh, automated decision-making systems um, in Colombia, particularly by the, the, the national government. Um, so just let me walk you through my short presentation. I'll give you just a bit of context about algorithmic transparency rules in Colombia. Um, then I'll uh, let you know, um, I'll tell you about the government's active transparency initiatives, uh, things that have happened with information requests, requests re regarding algorithms, public algorithms. And then I'll finalize with some uh, reflections on the challenges that we currently have in Colombia. So um, as it occurs in, in most countries, Colombia does not have specific algorithmic transparency rules, but we do have some constitutional rights re regarding to right to access of information, particularly is, is information um, that the state uses uh, to, take in, uh, to take decisions. Um, and also uh, we've got um, a, a, a few uh, laws that have been de uh, developed um, um, on uh, uh, that are, are, are the access to information laws and, and data protection laws um, that also create uh, mechanisms for citizens to request um, information in general and that in practice have been used um, to request information about how um, um, public algorithms operate and, and particularly what personal data they use. Um, Colombia also has a national AI public policy uh, since 2019. This policy uh, deals more with the question of how uh, AI can be promoted both at the public and private spheres. Um, it's uh, less about the risks of AI and more about how we can use more AI. Um, and then a couple of years afterwards, the government uh, issued an AI ethical framework um, 
of course, thinking about how can AI be de developed uh, responsibly and um, according to uh, different principles that uh, inspire this framework, including the OECD's principles um, of um, trustworthy and responsible AI. And um, as part of uh, this a AI ethical frameworks implementation, the government created some repositories of algorithms um, whereby um, voluntarily the uh, government organizations that use AI or in general um, that use uh, uh, automated decision-making systems, they can um, register um, their algorithms so that anyone can access them. Um, so this is more or less the context. And, and now to give you a bit, uh, an overview of what has happened. So the government has created several repositories for algorithms. Um, so uh, the first one that you see, uh, the AI repository is a development that's spun from the um, ethical framework. And then the government has an open data repository and within this open data repository, they have included some uh, information of AI systems. And finally, the, the Ministry of Information and, and, and Communication Technologies has its own um, public innovation, digital public innovation repository that includes some AI systems. So uh, what you're seeing in this slide is the, in parenthesis, is the number of projects that have been registered in these repositories. Um, sometimes there's an overlap. So it's not that we have 20 different repositories registered, but there's a, uh, some overlap, uh, but let's say that we have around like 15 repositories uh, where we have uh, public information about uh, what type of data they use, uh, what uh, government entity is uh, responsible for the, for the um, AI, what are the functions that the AI carries out and so forth. So very basic information. So that sounds very good. That sounds like the government is uh, fulfilling its uh, active transparency role, and so far so good. But uh, what we have found in, in, in the research in, um, is that there's actually a huge gap of information. Uh, so there's um, um, an annual survey uh, that the civil service um, unit at, uh, at the national government um, runs every year. And in, uh, in the last two years, they have asked a question about the emerging technologies that uh, public organizations at any level in Colombia are using. So uh, in the 2021 public survey, 172 governmental organizations answered that they use AI. 116 you said they used a robotic process automation, um, which is not necessarily AI, but, but it, it, it helps um, uh, taking automated decisions. Um, um, 50 then, 55 of them said we both actually, uh, we, we use both of them, both AI and RPI. And um, it's actually very interesting because most of the organizations that answered uh, positively are not national, but subnational. So let's say city council, city, mayor's office, and, and so forth. Uh, so 64% of, of them are subnational and 46% uh, 46 of them are, are national. Um, we are um, at Universidad Rosario also creating our own repository uh, of um, AI and ADM systems. And so far we have identified, identified 33 of them. So this, is, this gives you a, a bigger uh, idea of this gap of information that I have mentioned. Uh, we built this repository using diverse primary and secondary sources. Um, currently, we are uh, working with the national government uh, to, uh, a, as a joint endeavor between the university and the government to create um, a, a, a more detailed repository um, precisely using the uh, results of the um, performance survey that I mentioned where um, over um, uh, 200 um, and organizations, public bodies said that they use some sort of, of AI or RPI system. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm working with them so that we can find a way to uh, actually map uh, uh, a greater uh, number of, of systems. And then, um, so this is the bit of active, active transparency, but of course there's another 
uh, important aspect of algorithmic transparency is and and it's when citizens request specific information from government so this is not information that it's publicly available uh, somewhere such as a repository but that actually is just um, requested specifically but by a citizen so there's a, a case that actually illustrates the the challenges uh, of uh, actually uh, gaining access to uh, basic information about public algorithms. So uh, during the pandemic, the national government launched an, an, a mobile application called Corona App. Uh, and Corona App was supposed to uh, help people um, upload information about whether they had or not COVID. Um, and, that, and that would help the government to um, geographically um, know uh, the patterns of, of covered uh, transmission and so forth and, and take decisions about what to do. And of course, also the person who through the app um, uh, claimed to have COVID, then they would uh, contact the person and so forth. And, and you know how these protocols work. So 2020, um, in, in the year 2020, a civil society organization called De Justicia, they uh, requested the, uh, the national government's uh, unit that was in charge of this uh, mobile app application to disclose the code used uh, with the um, through uh, through the app and uh, why this civil society was organization was uh, concerned uh, there were concerns about how sensitive data uh, uh, data personal data was being used um, of course uh, if it, the the if, if you are informing about having COVID-19 then you're informing uh, healthy uh, data which is very sensitive and um and this civil society organization was uh, wary about not just this but in general how the app was being used because it, it gave also information uh, about who you met where you were uh, because it, it uh, since you downloaded the app it gave GPS uh, uh, coordinates um, um, to the government. Um, so they requested the, this, the code source and a uh, source code, sorry. And um, the government denied uh, the request. They said, we are not going to disclose the code of our mobile app. Um, at first they said, we are not going to disclose the information because that uh, would imply that uh, that we disclose uh, personal data. So uh, the civil society organization uh, requested um, that the government reconsidered and said, look, we, we don't want personal data. We just want the code. We want the code of the software. So nothing to do with personal data. And the government once again denied the request and said, uh, well, um, this, the, the, the mobile app was developed by third parties and there are some intellectual property rights that would be breached if we uh, disclose information about the code. So we're not gonna give you the code. Um, so um, based on the constitutional right of uh, right to access of information and, um, and, and data protection, personal data protection, this civil society organization went before uh, uh, the judiciary to request the judiciary to um, uh, oblige the government to disclose the code, to release the code. So um, now the highest constitutional court of Colombia, the, the National Constitutional Court, is um, um, trying this case. Um, it, it reached the, the highest level uh, constitutional court. Um, and uh, the, the, here the, the, the great uh, debate is uh, between the tension between uh, data, data privacy, because the court still uh, has to address the argument of the government that Disclosing the code implies disclosing personal data, and also the idea that even if personal data is not released, whether uh, disclosing the code somehow creates uh, some security problems related with the data that was collected through the mobile app, and of course, in general, uh, uh, access to information right. Um, so um, the, the process is ongoing. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, we'll see whether the constitutional rights prevail and how will the court will balance uh, this case. And of, to finalize, well, we, we heard clearly some challenges in Colombia related to um, 
algorithmic transparency. We have no rules as most countries. And despite of the fact that, as I told you before, there are some general uh, access to information um, rights that help, that would, should help us uh, have um, access uh, to, to, to information regarding the algorithms. We, we now know because of the, the case that I just described that actually uh, it, it doesn't seem that uh, governments will freely um, disclose this information. Um, and also, despite the fact that the government has, has had some uh, active transparency initiatives, there, there's a huge gap between what the government is actually using um, and what it is disclosing to the public. Um, and of course, if, if we're thinking about, as uh, 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 one of the previous panelists said, developing uh, socio-technical -te systems that are beneficiary for everyone, um, well, we have to deal with these transparency issues uh, because transparency, of course, is also uh, uh, um, related with explainability and accountability. And of course, this it comes at the center of any democracy. So uh, with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Thanks so much, Juan. While we still have you, um, uh, Esteban from Costa Rica asked a quick question. So um, what government department is leading the AI policy? Is it the, is it the Ministry of Science or a different department? That's a great question because uh, we just changed the national government. So a few weeks ago, actually. So before that, uh, it was actually the national, uh, the president's office who was um, leading everything uh, rather than the Ministry of Technology or the Ministry of Science or any other unit. It was actually the president's office uh, because there was someone within the presidency that was very interested in AI topics, but now they're gone. So actually there's a huge question as who's gonna take this? And um, we, I still don't have an answer for that. Let's see. <laughs> Gotcha. Thank you so much. All right. With that, we'll turn it over to Sally for an introduction. Uh, thank you, Emily. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, let me try to share my screen and see if that will work, hopefully. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we can see. Also in presentation mode. Um, I only have three very quick slides because I, I think the, the meat of this will really be in the discussion. Um, so just briefly, uh, we started in Egypt working on a national AI strategy uh, just over three years ago, and we published it in uh, early 2020. Um, it's available online if you'd like to take a look. It's on um, uh, ai.gov.eg. Um, but really what I want to, to focus in on today is to give you a, a background of the, the framework of the strategy and then zero in on uh, issues related to data governance and privacy and so on. Uh, so the national AI strategy has the slogan of AI for development and prosperity. So we're very clear that our goal of having a national AI strategy at all is to serve the com the country's uh, development goals and to to aid its prosperity, and that's why the four pillars kind of re reflect that a little bit. So uh, the first pillar we have is um, called AI for government or AI for G, as we like to call it, uh, which is uh, building on the digital transformation efforts that have been going on in Egypt for the past ten years or so. Um, to then take this a step further and explore how AI can help add value, add more transparency and efficiency to government processes, uh, whether it's the back end of government work or government to citizen services. Uh, the second one we call AI for development, uh, which is the absorption of AI into key economic sectors uh, for the first phase of the strategy, which actually ends by, by the end of this year. Uh, we're focusing on agriculture, healthcare, uh, infrastructure, uh, but also natural language processing for Arabic, obviously, as an enabler for everything else. Um, and then the third one is uh, capacity building, whether it's 
for individuals or organizations, and we'll come back to how that relates to, to data governance and data availability. And then the last one is the role we play regionally and internationally, especially in promoting issues around responsible AI, um, transparency, uh, ethics, and so on. More important than the pillars we've found out as we've been going through this process are the enablers. And um, we'd identified four <clears throat> going in, uh, namely uh, governance, of course, so that includes legislation, but also policies to um, enable an AI industry to thrive, whether it's uh, ethical principles, but also uh, laws around IP, around data privacy, and so on. Uh, the second one is data, and this is what we'll, we'll focus on today, everything from collection to storage, curation, protection, availability, but also monetization in, in many cases. Um, then having an enabling ecosystem of uh, strong academia, strong research, uh, but also an environment that inherently supports startups of any kind that can also help support AI startups so they're not starting from scratch. Um, and then infrastructure, whether it's compute, storage, connectivity, access, uh, and so on. Um, over the past uh, three years, like I said, we've been working on implementing a huge number of projects. And uh, I'll kind of give you a couple of examples of projects we've implemented um, in a kind of a public-private partnership setting, uh, just to illustrate how this uh, brought up the the challenges of um, of data governance um so let me first tell you that uh, again very similar to to what juan mentioned uh, in colombia uh, we have the legislation so we have laws uh, for cybersecurity, for ip protection they need to be updated a little bit to accommodate ai but they do exist uh, and we also have a data protection law uh, very similar to GDPR, actually. However, as we went through uh, implementation of these projects and, and enabling of the entire ecosystem, we realized that legislation is not enough. You also need to have what I like to call a data culture. You need to, uh, for everyone involved in the ecosystem, to really understand the importance of data, um, why we need it, how we need to make it available, the challenges that arise, and I'll, I'll go into some of them as I go through uh, the examples, um, and then also a kind of a, a data av availability versus protection conundrum that, uh, that we're all dealing with. Uh, so to give you just three quick examples, the um, the picture and and some of these are, are stock photos of, of course but some are, are actual photos from from projects um so for example the uh, the two in the middle the the one where you can see kind of agricultural plots uh with their boundaries identified and then the one directly below with the kind of orange and white uh, ui these are two agriculture projects that we've implemented uh, the one at the bottom is actually a smart farmer's assistant that is centered around a chatbot uh, that can work in both text and speech. Um, and it's designed to give uh, smallhold farmers uh, advice, general advice about their, their crops, when to irrigate, when to fertilize, uh, up-to-date market prices, weather uh, forecasts, and so on and so forth. And the one directly above it is uh, a satellite image analysis project to identify uh, very small hold uh, plots, uh, especially in the Nile Delta, uh, and also uh, as a second stage, identify the crop type and um, stage of growth uh, with the uh, purpose of calculating the exact amount of irrigation water that is needed uh, for that particular plot. And for both of these, we had massive data related challenges. Uh, first of all, when we started, many um, people in, in kind of different government organizations, be it the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation, uh, or even in some uh, civil society and, and private entities, had no idea what kind of data would be needed. And in many cases, there was no data at all. And we actually had to start collecting it from scratch. Um, 
and uh, it had to be, of course, the right quality, the right quantity, the right volume, the right frequency of updates of this data. Uh, and then we faced problems in, uh, so where does this data actually sit? Who has access to it and so on and so forth. Uh, so that was a, a massive challenge around data availability to start with. And it's something that needs to be built in any AI project is how much time would you actually need to assess the, the state of your data. And uh, in many cases, what we're having to do is develop uh, a data strategy in parallel to the AI strategy for, for implementing any project. Um, the second example is uh, from the right, and this is stock footage, but it, it just shows you uh, handwritten text. And of course, Egypt being a very old country, we have lots of uh, handwritten uh, ancient manuscripts and so on, uh, but they're mostly in Arabic. And uh, what we wanted to do was to uh, build a semantic search engine that could help researchers uh, by putting all of this material online. We've faced massive um, challenges in simply uh, having an OCR to begin with, so not even talking about uh, the actual NLP, but but just the OCR part of uh, something that can work on identifying handwritten text in Arabic. Uh, we found uh, some research on, on doing it for Latin languages, but not for Arabic, so we're having to actually uh, do an R&D project from scratch to uh, do this in Arabic, and it's massively, massively challenging. Um, but then even if you have the data, so for example, another project we're doing is automated translation uh, to and from Arabic uh, to many different languages. Uh, and of course, there you have the challenges of uh, no um, really uh, certified data corpus of um, Arabic, be it modern standard Arabic, which is the, the written language, or even uh, Egyptian slang, which is the mostly spoken language in Egypt. Uh, so again, we had to work on, on building those, and this means time, it means money, it means delay in the project, it means that you have to educate your, your workforce and, and part of your team um, to sit down and, and do this um, annotation. And I think uh, Lisa mentioned this uh, quite a lot, uh, the challenges with, with labeling massive amounts of data, and sometimes it's not even realistic. Uh, the third example I want to use is, uh, doesn't have a picture presenting it, unfortunately, but it was um, with the Ministry of Justice where we were building a machine learning system to help expedite uh, court rulings on things like uh, family law, so um, divorce settlements and so on. And the challenge there was that this part of government was just beginning its digital transformation journey. And so not only didn't you have the data, even when you had it, it was in a format that was unusable. And I can write volumes about the challenges of Arabic text being entered in a handwritten format. And the problem is you can't easily transfer any of this, right? Because most research and, and most products are based on, on English or Latin languages that, of course, don't really translate into Arabic at all. Um, so in many cases, we're, we're having to build everything from scratch. Um, but also, there was a lack of awareness of, so what can we actually share? Because if you want to dig into um, historic rulings of family courts and detect, uh, you know, so how much alimony was actually um, assigned there and, uh, and what can we learn um, to, to inform future cases and so on. Uh, so what is actually okay to share and what, what do you need to anonymize, what do you need to encrypt and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was uh, a challenge because there was no awareness essentially in the entities that we worked with about what was okay to share and what wasn't. And so everyone, um, human nature defaults to being protectionist and says, okay, we're not going to share anything just to err on the side of caution. And, and that's why um, when, when we talk about challenges with, with data privacy and data protection, um, what I often find in kind of international fora is in, in developing countries, we talk about protecting data because the default is we're sharing it, but we just want to make sure that when we share it, we share it in a, a responsible way. 
on my experience in Egypt and, and other developing countries, I work a lot with um, within the African Union and the Arab League of States and so on, is that it's it's often quite the opposite. So you have challenges with, with data availability to begin with, but then even when you have data available, there is not enough awareness, not enough education of how do we classify this data? How do we determine um, which is the highest sensitivity level and which is the lowest sensitivity level? How do we actually develop an open data culture that, that enriches uh, startups and, and the research environment without damaging personal freedoms and personal rights and or also potentially national security? Uh, so that's what I feel is, is really missing in developing countries, including Egypt, is to, to start developing that that culture of data awareness, everything from um, collection, governance, management, but also uh, classification and availability. Um, and a couple of things we've we've done to kind of try to address that is, of course, uh, capacity building and awareness programs for uh, for the entire ecosystem. So any stakeholders really. Uh, but what we're also working on, and this is in the in the very early stages of development, and uh, this is kind of sorry, it got jumbled a little bit in in the uh, in the um, uh, conversion. But this is just to illustrate: uh, we're building a unified AI and data platform for Egypt to enable startups, to enable research organizations, academia, and so on, uh, to have access to uh, kind of certified, trusted components that they can use to build AI uh, applications quickly and easily, but also to have data repositories that are trusted, that are certified, that are secure, um, and of course, properly um, anonymized and or encrypted as needed so that uh, there is at least this level of mutual trust between data sharers and and data users. Um, so this is uh, just one way of of trying to combat this challenge, but it is a, a huge challenge, and uh, I'd I'd love to have a conversation with uh, with anyone who wants to talk about this. Um, and then finally, uh, what we're also finding is uh, back to Lisa's presentation is that in many cases we have to be um, a bit creative about uh, managing data so not necessarily relying on huge uh, volumes of data but also thinking about shortcuts things like frugal learning like federated learning uh, like transfer learning as well uh, so as to uh, circumvent or reduce the need for having these massive um, amounts of data sets that we just haven't accumulated over time and not having to wait uh, until they're all there. So this is just kind of a quick overview and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally, for sharing. Um, to, to both of you, uh, again, we, we appreciate you being here. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll kick off our Q&A session. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, so I think I'll, I'll pose a question to both of you. Um, one of this month's newsletter articles uh, from Nature Journal emphasized the need for data sets to be intentionally designed with artificial intelligence in mind, so the use for, for AI um, applications. Um, so what might this look like in the context of your specific regions or lens of work? And how could local policies be designed to best encourage or enforce large sample AI training data sets that are inclusive and equitable and, and accurately reflective of respective populations? We can start with Juan and then uh, go over to Sally. Well, I think um, the national government of Colombia has um, built in, in the last years, at least from the policy persp perspective, um, a, a good framework for um, open data and for um, building infrastructure uh, for data, not just in the public sector, but also in the private sector. And, and I guess that as it happens in most developing countries, um, we don't lack a, a sound policy. We may lack, a, lack probably the capacity of implementing such policy. Um, and, and, and of course that means hardware, software, human resources and so forth. And, and I guess the, the biggest challenge uh, for us is not, not just simply 
uh, having the objective of, of, of uh, building data sets that can be used for AI and improve in general, just the quality of data, but actually having the means, the economic means, the infrastructural means and to do it. And, and I guess that in, in that sense, um, the work that uh, governments uh, with companies and with uh, foreign governments who, who want uh, to uh, contribute to, to these efforts, well, they are just uh, essential. Um, clearly, um, most of the countries of the world, I would guess, would not be able to do it on their own. Um, and, and that's why I guess um, uh, what we heard today about uh, the joint work of the US national government with other countries of the world and uh, among academics, uh, US academics and, on, and other academics, well, that sounds like the path for me. Fantastic, thank you so much, Sally, over to you. I don't think I can add much to what Juan said. He basically covered it all. Uh, all of this really applies to Egypt. And I think, um, yes, definitely the point about having the economic means to actually do it, because uh, there are lots of great ideas out there, but then how do you implement it in, in a very challenging environment? Whereas I see Esteban in the, um, in the chat also mentioning uh, the point about digitization and that in, in many developing countries, even digitization efforts are still underway. Mm. So we're far away from saying, okay, now we have this data, it's not really valuable for AI. So let's start a whole new data collection effort that actually is designed for AI. I think that's a little bit uh, further away for us, but but it does require uh, also, as Juan mentioned, uh, collaboration across many different sectors, especially public-private partnerships uh, that can fund and and shepherd these uh, these activities. Absolutely, those partnerships are 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 vital to the success of, of data development and applications. Uh, so I wish that we had time for more questions. I see a couple in the chat, um, but we are running out of time. So we are happy to forward those questions along to um, our panelists. Um, and with that, thank you again so much uh, for, for being here to speak with us this morning. Uh, and I will be passing it back over to Lloyd Whitman. Let's see if I can get my, my, <clears throat> my uh, unmute for the first time. Yeah, so, so uh, another great, really great webinar. Uh, I want to thank Rich and the State Department once again for their partnership and support of this program. Julia and Julia and Emily for running another, another great webinar for our team and our speakers, Margaret, Lisa, Juan and Sally for really engaging discussions and lastly, our participants who we can always count on to pose thoughtful and challenging questions. So I just wanna, I'll, I always like to end with what I, I think at least for me are some key takeaways. So um, I'll have four of them today. Uh, the first is uh, as we heard from Margaret that as hardware development is moving closer, moving AI more and more to the edge, what we call the edge, for example, right there on your cell phone as opposed to out in the cloud. Uh, and as this development happens, uh, there's a continued, need, a continued need to consider applications and policies throughout the R&D process and engage the R&D community, which is something we did a little bit again today uh, in this process. Um, a really interesting concept that from IBM, this, this concept of expanding AI into different languages, I, re I really love that, you know, associated with different kinds of, qu answering different kinds of questions, uh, different kinds of processes, applying the, the languages of different fields is, is a really, uh, a really, um, really interesting concept and development. And I, I think that goes into my third takeaway, uh, which we heard in a number of cases, which is bridging data divides is a, a term I, I really like. Um, bridging data divides is a fundamental underlying need. And as we hear again and again, it requires resources on its own complementary to AI related investments for those to work together. And then finally, a point that I, every time we have one of these webinars uh, reminds me to say um, that given you know, there's great power, given the risks um, in the applications, and we think about risks ranging from AI-based content generation to the use of uh, AI for government and business process automation, and lots of different examples got mentioned of that today, I'm continually reminded that a foundational issue for AI development is that people, people need to decide what we're going to allow 
the output of AI to be used for. So we, you know, AI may generate all kinds of things, but we need to figure out, we need to be, people need to decide how that's used and, and be aware of that. So with that, I'm going to uh, thank everybody uh, again for uh, participating and encourage everyone to keep participating and encourage all the other participants who weren't here uh, to join us live so we can interact. And thanks and have a good day.